Hi, in this session, I'd like to talk about amplifying student engagement. My name is Ted Ladd, and I'm a professor at the Halt International Business School. I'd like to go through six different things. The first is my pedagogical goals, just to make sure we share the same desired outcome. How I ask students to prepare, how I design each session, what teamwork looks like in my classrooms, what the plenary large group discussions look like, and finally, how I assess their skills. To start, my goal is to have the students not only feel at the center of the room, but be at the center of the room. The pinnacle of my teaching, when I know I'm doing a really good job, is when the students forget I'm there because they are working with each other and progressing towards the agenda that I had outlined. I also highlight skills over knowledge. What can they do as a result of that particular session? I want to ensure that I am giving equal opportunity to everybody in the class and that I am affirming them. This is part of our job as professors isn't just to impart skills or knowledge. It is also to build their self-confidence. Self um, and then finally, I want to beat TikTok and Facebook. I do not allow. I disallow computers or phones in my classroom. Instead, I like it because when I see somebody's head go down and I know that they're on Facebook, it's an instant signal to me that I need to do something different. Let me provide a quick background so you can determine whether I'm credible. First, I'm a professor at Holt. My home campus is in San Francisco, but Holt International Business School also has campuses in Boston, New York, London, Shanghai, and Dubai. I specifically teach graduate students entrepreneurship, economics, and strategy. In addition, um, my readings are pretty good. My average of, after almost 60 courses is about 4.64 uh, 4 out of 5. I also teach at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts, part-time. My ratings there are 4.8 out of 5 after seven courses. And in the near future, I will start teaching at Stanford University, um, based primarily on my teaching performance. So for student preparation, I employ the flipped classroom methodology, where I do not lecture in class. I pre-record all of my lectures, including graphs, equations, frameworks. I'll even tee up questions from the case that I would like them to address in their preparation. This way they can watch all of my lectures before they even get into the room. Here's an example of the screen using Panopto. And I particularly, I intentionally chose a picture, a screenshot where I'm not looking good. Students don't care that much about the sound and the whiz bangs and whether the, whether the text flies in or flies out. 90% of the benefit of the flipped classroom can be achieved using any software whatsoever, including PowerPoint narration, which is what I'm doing right now. I also prioritize the materials that I'd like them to read separated by required, recommended, optional, and then geek out. This prioritization increases the likelihood that everybody will have done the required reading. And I also think it gives some motivation for the more ambitious students to continue to read. I typically assign a case for most classes, and I've recently transitioned from standard written cases on a PDF to video only multimedia cases. I find that that's how current, my current students typically uh, use information when they're at home on TikTok or YouTube. So why not meet them where they are? Uh, it also means that because I'm recording, if the, if the speaker from the case comes into class, I record that, create more videos. So as a result, the case remains updated and contemporary. Here's an example of that case. This is um, using Get My Boat and its CEO, Sasha Mornell. This is broken up into eight chapters and each chapter has five short snippets, each about three minutes long. 
Students seem to very much enjoy it. They watch it. They're prepared for it. And they are ready to discuss the content from the videos. Now into session design. The key for me is to put everything into 20 minute sprints. It doesn't mean every 20 minutes we're changing topics. It does mean every 20 minutes we're changing how we discuss those topics. Frequently I'll start with some randomized negotiation. So I'll put people together in random and have them do a negotiation that highlights the problem that we're gonna be trying to address that day. Um, I also inject other types of 20 minute sprints. For example, especially when I'm teaching only online, I'll invite my yoga instructor for a 15 minute session of chair yoga. I'll use simulations for 20 minutes. If there's a kid who walks by on a Zoom, I'll say, wait, grab the kid, grab the kid. Let's talk to, talk to the kid about this particular topic. Um, so any possibility to change the energy just a little bit keeps everybody's attention. Here's an example of one of the negotiations I do. Instead of handing out cards that says, you're the buyer and you're the seller, here's the background, I use simple Google Forms. This also means that when I'm teaching hybrid classes or Zoom classes, I don't need any additional materials. Same link, here we go. This is an example of the simulation that I built using software from Forio, F-O-R-I-O dot com where I just created an Excel spreadsheet and the software translates that into a multi-round simulation. And then finally here, every now and then when I wanna bring in personal stories, I'll show a picture of me doing something and I'll ask them to reciprocate by taking a picture that's on their phone and broadcasting that to the screens or onto Zoom to show them doing something that relates to the principle we're discussing in class. This humanizes everybody. We all then can connect better. I don't do a lot of traditional 15 minute breaks where I say, leave your brains, turn your brains off and go do something else. Instead, I'll say, here's a 20 minute exercise. You have 35 minutes to do it. If you'd like to take longer with your team, that's fine. If everybody wants to go to Starbucks, that's fine. Please go together and continue to work on the exercise. I'll also send notes to people in the group during these breaks or team exercises if they seem disconnected to ask them how I can do a better job for them. And the, when they see that somebody is paying attention to them and is trying to address their concerns, they're more engaged, not because they're worried, I think, about punishment, but because they feel seen, they feel heard, um, they feel affirmed. Let's talk about teamwork. So in addition to these random pair or trio negotiations, I try when I'm teaching in a hybrid class to have teams not cross the boundary of electronics. So people who are on Zoom are on a team, people who are in the room are on teams. I try not to have teams that have people who are both on Zoom and in person. Um, I find that the, it, the confusion is too much. And when I send them off for team exercises, I ask very specific questions typically that I have given in the flipped video, but never questions of fact. I don't want to be in a position where I say somebody's wrong. I'll ask them questions of opinion. So do this math problem and then tell me what you do and give me reasons why you think maybe that's good or maybe that's bad. Like the math said this, is there a management issue that's related to this? So this way people can bring in opinions and I'm also not stuck in the position of saying, no, you're wrong because that can be humiliating for some people. Um, I also use open-ended polls for difficult questions frequently where the submissions to the poll are anonymous. Zoom has this, but it's numerical only, and I want open-ended. I want people to put in a whole sentence if necessary. This allows me to see themes. I can pick out different answers and I can ask, that's a great answer, does the person who said that want to volunteer more? And if they don't, they don't have to. But this is a great way for everybody to contribute. Um, here is an example of what that poll looks like. I happen to use poll everywhere. Let me go to plenary discussion. First, I use randomized cold calls, but I explicitly say to them in the very beginning, I'm not trying to, to humiliate you. 
I'm not trying to catch you out. I am using randomized cold calls so that I can get some of the quieter voices into the conversation. And that is a motivation that they respect. It also, these cold calls also do indeed increase preparation because people are worried about being humiliated in front of their peers. But for the first few questions of a course, when they don't know me, they don't know what a cold call looks like, I'll say, the case, here's the case. The protagonist is John. Before we even get to the case, I'll ask the student, hey, I looked you up on LinkedIn last night, and I find that you were a pilot for the Royal Air Force. Tell me what that was like. This means that automatically they relax. Their purpose in the cold call is to answer a question they already know, and I don't. So they're very comfortable. This is also a way for everybody else in the room to say, oh my goodness, there's an RAF pilot in the room. So that's a trick to get everybody more calmed down about cold calls. Typically the response to my cold calls, it's mentioned in most of my course comments, and it's typically four in one uh, in, in favor of doing cold calls. And the typical comment goes something like, I don't like the idea of cold calls, but I recognize that it gets me to prepare and it introduced me to, to speak. So yeah, you should probably keep it. That's typically what they look like. Here's an example of a sheet that I use. I have this on my computer while I'm asking questions. I have everybody lined up so I can, I can, can know who's coming up next. I record their scores across all of the sessions of the course. I have an average. If it turns out that they weren't there or they give a bad answer, I'll intentionally try to return to them at some point during the course to boost their score and have them look good in front of their peers. Very simple, easy method that scales well, even across classes of 100 to 120 people. Finally, for assessments, I very rarely use tests because tests in the business world don't really exist. I sometimes use quizzes to make sure that they can do some of the math that I need them to know how to do. But my typical um, assessments instead look like this. I ask teams to get together to solve a problem. Pick a company that has a problem, solve the problem using principles of the class. But please record it. Don't do it live in class. While I love live presentations and it's important for them to learn that skill, it's because the second assignment that I, that I ask them to do is I individually and randomly assign students in the class to critique one of the team recordings. I give them a word template that literally walks through the syllabus so that they can answer all of the questions of the syllabus. This becomes then a review of all of the materials of the course. They're providing information that I give back to the team. So each team at the end of the course will have my feedback on their team presentation, and they may have five to 10 anonymous individual critiques from other students. So there's a ton of feedback. This is my other beef with the test, is once they take the test, the test has no utility for anybody else in the class afterwards. An individual peer-reviewed critique does indeed have utility afterwards. So it's a good learning tool for the individual, and it has a benefit for other people. To summarize, my goal is student centricity. I use the flipped classroom method and I prioritize the materials I like them to prepare ahead of time. In the class, I use 20 minute sprints. For teamwork, I'll frequently use open-ended polls for the plenary discussion. When everybody's all together, I use cold calls. And finally, for assessments, I'll use peer-reviewed work with a template that I have described. Hopefully some of these techniques are helpful to you to amplify student engagement. And by putting my LinkedIn, I invite you to connect to pose alternative questions, comments, feedback on my own suggestions here. I hope you have a great rest of your conference.